Good evening, and welcome to another Bible study here at Hurricane Baptist Church. It's our Wednesday night Bible study, and we're into the study of the book of Acts. And if we've been moving along, this is our 12th session, that we've talked about uh, different things going on in the book of Acts. We're down to chapter 4. We'll be looking at verses 1 to 12 this evening. Remember back in chapter 3 that uh, Peter and John are going to the temple, and the lame man was sitting there by the wayside there and uh, begging, and uh, that Peter lifted him up and spoke to him in the name of Jesus and they healed him and he stood up and he's jumping he's carrying on and everybody's getting all excited in the temples he's running around there and they're looking at this man that's been well he would find out here a little bit later that uh, he's been over 40 years he's been paralyzed been paralyzed from birth and and now it's, it's a miracle they, they can't believe it so everybody's all excited and <clears throat> so we see that the idea that we get here in, in uh, chapter 4 verse 1 says so and Peter's uh, talking to the people. In fact, we back up a little bit over in uh, chapter 3, verse 12. Uh, when they all come running to him, and Peter saw it, he answered unto the people. And he starts there at ye men of Israel, and from the rest of that chapter to, through verse 26, he's talking to them, telling them what they did and who they are and what's going on. And, and uh, so we get down to verse 4, and, and Peter and John now, they've, they're doing what God told them to do. All right, Jesus gave them marching orders. You know, he says, you know, you go go into all the world and you're going to make disciples and you're going to baptize. And so they're out there, they're spreading the gospel. They're telling people what they need to be doing and, and they're out there and they're working. But you know, just because you're doing what God wants you to do doesn't mean that things always go smooth for you, does it? Uh, sometimes people, you'd be surprised, would you believe that sometimes people don't want to hear about the Lord, they don't want to hear about the Bible, don't want to hear about God. So we have these... These people here involved, they, this man's been healed, and it's a great miracle. You would think everybody would be celebrating, but there's a few people that got upset about it, and that's what we're going to see here in chapter 4, verse 1. And as they spake unto the people, that's Peter and John, they're talking, Peter's uh, the speaker, his peers, uh, the priest and the captain, or the ruler of the temple, and, of, and the Sadducees came upon them. So they're, Peter and John, they're, they're up there, and, and they're, Peter's at preaching to the people, and so here comes the, the rulers. And uh, they, they, it's not the fact that the man is healed that's uh, their problem. It's that Peter is preaching the resurrection, and they just can't handle that. Go, go to verse 2. Being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Whoa, so the, the problem we see now, understanding we have the Pharisees and the Sadducees are the two the major parties that we look at. The Sadducees are the, the aristocrats. They're kind of the, they're more the, the in control type. Uh, and they denied, they denied a bodily resurrection. It can't be a bodily resurrection. They didn't believe there was any, any going on from this world. When this body died, they didn't, didn't believe anything going on past that. Uh, so they denied a bodily resurrection. And here's Peter, and he's preaching a bodily resurrection. Now, if we don't see the Pharisees mentioned here because the Pharisees believed in the resurrection. They believed in a bodily resurrection. So that was a, a big difference between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. There were others too, but that's the, those are two of the, the big differences right there. And uh, so they're preaching that, and that they're worried. You see, he's teaching the people that there's a resurrection, and they're worried that they teach the opposite. So what happens if the people start believing them? What happens if the people start turning to them and uh, believe in what they're trying to say? So they want to stop them, and it's late in the day. So we see in verse 3, they laid hands on them and put them in hold or put them in a prison until the next day, for it was now eventide. So they shut them up and get them out of the way. They just arrested them, basically, and put them in jail. And, uh, and then verse 4, how be it, they didn't quite get there in time, did they? How be it, many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men... Look at that, was about 5,000. So over there in the second chapter, uh, we read about 3,000. And now here we are in the fourth chapter, we're talking about 5,000. So the, the word of God's going out. Men are being convicted of the sin. And they're getting saved. And we see the, the power of the word of God. Uh, when we get up and we pro promote and uh, put out the word of God to where people can hear it, it'll make a difference. And that's what we need to do. Uh, Peter, he's up there and he's, he's preaching to them and, and the, even though they've been taken away and put in jail, there's already been 5,000 men and we don't know how many women and, and young people uh, heard and believed. And it came to pass on the morrow that the rulers and elders and scribes and Annas, the high priest, 
and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together in Jerusalem. So we see here now they've added to it. Okay, up in, in verse 1 we see it was the, uh, the priest and the captain of the temple or the ruler of the temple and uh, the Sadducees. Now we come down here and they've got the rulers, the elders, and the scribes along with the high priest. So this would be the Sanhedrin. Okay, so the, the Sanhedrin is kind of the governing body. It's uh, the ruling body, the governing governing body. It's the, kind of like the Supreme Court of the Jewish people. So we have all this authority there. And we have these high priests. Uh, Annas, is, um, he's called the high priest here. He's recognized by the Jews as high priest. But something happened that he fell into disfavor with Rome and he was removed and Caiaphas then is the high priest in the Romans' eyes. So there's a, a little bit of difference there, but they're, they're of the same family and we see the rest of the people that are brought into it. Um, they're all part of the, the family of the high priest and the, a couple of them mentioned there, John and Alexander. Uh, we never hear from them. I have no idea who they were or where they came from except for the fact that they were uh, they're part of that family. So. So then the question comes, and we get down to verse number 7. And when they had set them in the midst, they bring them, and they set them in the middle of them there, and they ask, by what power or by what name have you done this? Now, that is a great question, and it's a great opportunity for Peter. Uh, you know, as a, as a pastor, as a preacher, uh, one of the greatest questions I can be asked is, what must I do to be saved? I've only had that happen to me a couple times in my ministry where someone actually come out and ask me those words, what must I do to be saved? And what an opportunity uh, to share the gospel. And that's what uh, Peter has right here. He says, uh, by what power have you done this? How, are you, how did you do this, Peter? How could you heal this a man? What is the source of your power? And so we see then Peter's going to respond. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, and notice that little... Uh, part right there said unto them ye rulers and people rulers of the people and elders of Israel so we see Peter remember Peter remember when they uh, took Jesus down to the hall to for his trial and remember Peter he's up there and he denied him three times he was worried he was concerned and so he he denied even knowing Christ and now here he is with the root the ruling party, it's all the rulers of the uh, nation of the, of the Jews, of the nation of Israel here, and he's before them, and they're confronting him. What are you doing? How could you do this? What's the source of your power? And so we see the difference, though. You notice the difference? He was before the crucifixion of Christ, before Pentecost, and what happened to Pentecost, we saw earlier, the Holy Spirit came, didn't he? The Holy Spirit, God had promised the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, the Father will send him when I leave. And we see at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came and uh, he indwelled. He moved in to the bodies of the believers. And we see Peter here, he's filled, he's controlled with the Holy Spirit. And he says here that he's going to speak to them now. And um, sometimes people get worried. They say, you know, uh, what would I say? What can I say? And uh, over in uh, Luke 11, or 12, excuse me, 12, 11 and 12, it says this, and when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto the magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say. If you're if you're put in a position, and we're using the authorities here, but if you're put into any position where you have the opportunity to witness, we need to take that opportunity to witness. Don't worry, because verse 12 says, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you that in the same hour what you ought to say. The Holy Spirit will give you the words. Um, I know that uh, there's been several times I read a lot about the voice of the martyrs, people in the foreign lands being persecuted and how they're brought in before the authorities and challenged for their faith and challenged to renounce their faith. And uh, several times they've talked about how they were they were fearful. Uh, what what will I say? What can I say? And how uh, they were brought in and how that they this all of a sudden they said things and and they didn't have any idea where it came from. They had not planned to say it. But all of a sudden it just come to them and that was the power of the Holy Spirit and giving them the words to say and how, how did it work out that some got, some got delivered, uh, some got thrown back in prison, some had a harder time. But God worked through them and uh, so they, they were willing to, to take a stand. And that's what Peter's doing here and we see back in, uh, as we get into Paul's ministry, Paul is willing to take a stand when he's being confronted uh, back by Felix and later on in trials that he goes through. Uh, he's willing to take a stand. He says, I am what I am, and I'm going to tell you what, what I want to, need to tell you. And uh, 
let the, as they say, let the chips fall where they may. God's in control, so we know that whatever happens, we know that He's in control. They can't do anything to us that God doesn't allow. And then Peter's standing there, and uh, he's been doing what God told him to do. He was telling the people back over in, in chapter 3. He was preaching to them and telling them what had happened, how they crucified their Messiah, and what they needed to do. And now he's being confronted over that. And he says, you, you healed, you, that man was healed. What did you do? How did you have that power? And so we see a little bit farther here. He says, uh, if, if this day we be examined, verse 9, of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he has made whole, so you, you, your question is, you're examining, you're, you're wanting to know, uh, how did this impotent man, this crippled man, how did he, how could you heal him? How could you make him whole? And verse number 10 says, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and notice how he always keeps bringing us back to him, whom ye crucified, whom God hath raised from the dead. Remember, the Sadducees, there, there, they don't want to hear this. They don't want to hear anything about this. And he says, you crucified the Savior. You crucified Jesus Christ, and it's by his name God has raised him from the dead, even by him, that this man stand here before you whole. The power of the name of Jesus. He told his disciples, what you do in my name. See, it's in his name that we operate. It's in his name. It's in his power. We have no power of our own. We can't heal anybody. We can't save anybody. We can't even save ourselves. We don't have any power apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter is with boldness. He's saying here, uh, they're, they're doing, he's out there preaching and teaching. But on the other side, I want to bring another point here. Uh, the Sanhedrin, they're doing what they're supposed to do. And you think, whoa, what's going on? What do you mean they're doing what they're supposed to do? Peter is preaching something contrary to what the Sadducees have been preaching and teaching. And so the Bible tells them that uh, they need to examine. So I'm going back over, <coughs> excuse me, into Luke, uh, excuse me, Deuteronomy 13, uh, 1 to 5. So we go back over to Deuteronomy 13 and verses 1 to 5. And we see what, here's what they're doing. They're being, obe they're being obedient to the law. They're doing what they're supposed to do. He says here, if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, uh, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, Whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. So if you're going after another teaching, if you're going after a decent, different teaching, then thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and you shall serve him and cleave to him. And now listen. And that prophet, referring here to Peter, or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken to you, to, spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. So when we look at what he's saying there, he's saying this, the Sadducees are teaching there is no resurrection. There's no bodily resurrection. And Peter's saying there is a bodily resurrection. And so if they can prove him wrong, if they can prove he's wrong, then he's trying to teach something contrary to what they're teaching so then he can be put to death. They can get rid of him for good. And <clears throat> this, it, uh, this is a point to understand. There's many people today that when Easter season comes around, They'll say, no, there's not a bodily resurrection. It was a spiritual resurrection. Or they come up with all of these other things. Listen, that there is a body. There was a bodily resurrection. That is the truth. Any other teaching is a false teaching. So <clears throat> it takes away from what the Scripture says. The Bible tells us, if I believe in my heart, that God has raised him from the dead. We read over in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. So you have to believe in the resurrection, a bodily resurrection, and that's what Peter keeps bringing to them. They, at this point in time, it's not that long after the, the crucifixion of Christ. This, this isn't that much later. Remember, we just uh, he walked for 40 days. We went into 10 days after he ascended. Then we had Pentecost, and now we're only in the, the fourth chapter of Acts, so we're not that far into it. So many people uh, of the faith that, <coughs> excuse me, that saw him, 
They actually saw that bodily resurrection, so they know that there's a bodily resurrection. And so the Sadducees here, they're trying to teach and preach something. So they're examining Peter. They're trying to find a way to get rid of Peter to discredit him because they don't want to lose their power. They don't want to lose their authority if they fall into disfavor with the people. If this comes to pass and people believe that there is a bodily resurrection and they're saying not, <coughs> excuse me, then the people aren't going to want to follow them. And so they'll lose their position and Rome can step in and, and lose their power and their authority and all those things. So there's a lot more to this than just what we read about. So the point is that they're trying to do, they're being obedient. They're checking them out, which is what they should do. And that's what we should do. You know, this is another point to look at. When we hear somebody preaching and teaching, we need to go to the Scripture and see does it match with the written Word of God. All right? We need to make sure that that's what the Bible says. Not just what the man says. And, you know, people, preachers get up and teachers get up and, and sometimes they can misspeak. We can understand that. It's not a big doctrinal thing, but they can say Paul instead of Peter or something like that. But the idea is that they're teaching what the Bible says. All right? And so we need to measure that. Don't just take it for granted. If it doesn't sound right, you know, if you've been a student, student of the Bible for a while and uh, you've been studying it and somebody says something that doesn't sound right, uh, follow your gut and go find out whether it's right or not. I, I often think about that when I, I watch a, like a basketball game, you know, and sometimes they'll call traveling on a, on a basketball player. And uh, so well, did he travel or not? Listen, I found out that if you, if you think he traveled, he traveled because you, you pick up one. You can't always see it like that, but you just recognize it. And that's the way it is. When you, when somebody says something and you don't, it don't fit into what you believe about the Bible, go check it out. Maybe you've looked at it wrong. Maybe you've been told wrong. But go check it out and measure it. Make sure that it measures up uh, to the Word of God. And then we take what the Bible says, not what that man says, or what we always, what we preconceive to be true. No, we take what the Bible says, and that's what we follow. And so we see here the, the Sadducees and, and the, uh, well, the Sanhedrin, they're here now, and they're examining Peter. They're trying to find out what these, what, where he got this power. And he says in verse, he says, oh, back in verse 10, he says, uh, that by the name of Jesus, whom he crucified, whom God has raised from the dead, even by him does this man stay here before you whole. Not only was he physically whole, but he spiritually whole. The word whole has the idea of the whole person, his physical and his spiritual being. And he said, he's standing here because of Jesus, because of what Christ did. You crucified him, but he shed his blood to pay for our sins. And so this man, by his power, this man stands here. And this Jesus who you crucified, uh, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become what? The head of the corner, the most important part of the building, the head of the corner, the cornerstone. And we see over in, uh, I got it down in, in the Psalm 118, 22, the stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. Christ, he's the headstone, he's the cornerstone of the foundation of our faith. So we understand then in verse 12, he says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby ye must be saved. There's no other, there's no other name. There's, I don't care what anybody tells you, it's Christ and it's Christ alone. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's the name of Jesus. The power is in the name of Jesus. We claim the name. We put our faith and trust in the name of Jesus and that shed blood in the work that He did on Calvary. And that's why we read right here, there's salvation, there's deliverance, there's salvation in none other name under heaven. So if anybody tells you anything different, uh, they're, they're misleading you, they're, they're leading you, uh, deceiving you. And so again, we get back to the scripture. What does God say right here? There's nothing else. You can't claim any other name, and it's got to be the, the one and the only, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified, the Messiah. They crucified the Messiah. The Messiah was sent for the Jews. Jesus said, I came for the Jews, and they crucified him. But there's power in that name. They could, they could, they killed the body. They put the body in the grave, but the body couldn't stay in the grave. The body came out of the grave. The bodily resurrection of Christ. The Sadducees can't stand it, and they're confronting Peter and John with the, with what they want to trying to do to them, trying to discredit them. 
but they have the authority. They have the power of the Holy Spirit within them. They have the authority of the Word of God. And so they won't be denied. So we just we see how this this is developing here in, in the book of Acts, how, how these two men are, are going out and they're getting started. And we'll see as we get a little bit farther how that's going to start picking up some speed, some momentum, as we see the, the, the message going around the world in the known world at that time and seeing the effect of the, the missionary trips of Peter and Paul and uh, different ones as they go to these different towns and what they do uh, to, to this explode. The church just explodes. We've seen 8,000 already in the first three, I mean, chapter two, or three and, uh, two and four, rather. So we see all of these happening and how the church, just because they're going out and doing what they're supposed to do. They're telling, why, why are you doing what you're doing? What happened? And Peter said, I'm going to tell you. I'll tell you what happened. What has changed you? Why are you a different person than you were? I'll tell you. This is what I was. This is what happened. And this is what I became. You have a testimony. You have a witness. The power of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. No other name under heaven given among men whereby ye must. That could be or should be or would be. You must be saved. So if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've never put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, turn from your sin to repent and turn to God and put your faith and trust in Christ. This is the day. This is the day you need to do that. Put your faith in trust. The blood has been shed. The work has been done. If you're not saved, you need to get it taken care of. We don't know what. 2021 is coming up in just a few days. We don't know what the new year is going to bring. We don't even know if we'll get to the new year. But we know one thing. If we're in Christ, we have a secure future in heaven. So I implore you today, before this year is over, to turn and put your faith and trust in Christ. And if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, we hear so much in the first of the year, people make resolutions and all these silly things. You might make one good resolution. This year, I'm going to be a better testimony for the love of the Lord Jesus Christ for what He did for me. If you do that, and you please God, you'll have the greatest life you can have. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do just thank You again for this day and for this time. We thank You for the privilege, the privilege we have to come before Your throne of grace, that we can be Your, that we are Your children, and and we can come there and be confident that You're going to hear us and do what we ask you to do. We don't always get what we want, but you always answer our prayers, and we thank you for that. And if we, if someone's watching today that doesn't know Christ as their Savior, we pray, Lord, this would be the day, that this would be the hour, that they would repent and put their faith in Christ, and that we as Christians would live the kind of life that would draw them to you. And we we'll thank you for what you've done, for what you're going to do, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.